data should be treated more like a almost like like we treat the humanities right where there's like context and philosophy and implications that go into and come from data science and it doesn't seem to be like that's the orientation that goes into any data science training Welcome to What Gets Measured, a NinjaCat podcast about marketing, performance management, metrics, and effectiveness. Because what gets measured gets managed. I'm your host, Jake Sanders. Kyle Block is the head of research at Gradient Metrics, a company that integrates traditional market research with data science to create models and analysis tailored to clients' unique needs. He's been a research analyst, worked in the political sector, is packing several data degrees in his belt, and he's here today to talk about marketing data interpretation. Kyle, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jake. Very glad to be with you today. Uh, well, so let's jump in, man. Let's just go right for the jugular. What does data interpretation mean to you? And how does this ability help you in your work as a researcher? Right to the jugular we go. Yeah, in what it. What does data interpretation mean? God. Well, I think we're, we're in a world where there's so much of it. No one really knows how to make sense of it. The methods that we keep ginning up to tidy it, analyze it, make sense of it are not necessarily easy to interpret. And we've built a whole business, frankly, around developing, packaging, and applying what are complicated models. Mm. And we're certainly not the only people in the world who have done this. In fact, we're probably not, I maybe shouldn't admit this, not even the very best at that (laughs) element of what we do. But where I think we really excel is being able to in a very useful manner, interpret for our client partners what it is the results of the analysis actually mean and what the implications should be on very important decisions that they need to make. So, Natch, um, how, how, why don't I hear more about data interpreters? <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, I have not seen a job posting for a data interpreter in this century, at least. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that's a real shame. Uh, it, it, it's, and I see this in in academia. You know, my wife is a professor. Oh, okay. And there seems to be a lot more of a focus on the methodology, right? The the sexiness, the uniqueness of it, the novelty of the method. And that is where a lot of resources go. That's what attracts a lot of students probably to data science and econometrics. And I've always been a bit disappointed that the interpretation and the utility of those very impressive methods is downweighted. Hmm. And uh, I, I think, yeah, it's a real shame that we're underutilizing all of the investment in these incredible computational statistical models because we don't really know how to interpret them. That's a real shame. Uh, well, and, and also one of the things that I'm thinking of, like you're saying even in the levels of highest academia, this interpretation thing is being subsumed by methodology uh, fascination. And I mean, talk about people who are fascinated by methodology, marketers, business owners, um, they have d- data daily that they're interpreting, huge reams of it. What are those skills that are required for data interpretation? Or can the beauty of data be in the eye of the checkbook holder? Oh, that's a novel way to phrase that. <laughs> <laughs> Very safe way to phrase it? I don't know. I Yeah, I, I, there's certainly a kernel of truth in, in that, right? That what... The interpretation is certainly colored by the eyes of the individual paying the interpreter's paycheck, if there even is an interpreter. Yeah. But I think there's like some fundamental questions, really just two, that any interpreter, any consumer of data should be asking. And I don't hear them asked frequently enough. And the first is, let's say you're getting 
an insight about what your customers think about your brand relative to all of your competitors. And it could be a very favorable insight. But the first question that one should always ask is, where did this data come from? And more specifically, what population is this data claiming to be generalizable to? Because it could be that this highly favorable rating is from a sample, let's say it's a US-based company that only sells products in America. It could be that the data sample is from a bunch of individuals who live in the Netherlands. Oops. It, it sounds basic, but like there's a lot of what we call sample frame mismatch, where the question you're trying to answer relates to a specific population, yet the data that was collected to help answer that question maps to a slightly different population. And you make important decisions based off of the wrong population. So that's question one. Like, where did this data come from? To what population is it claiming to be generalizable about? Let's start there. Okay. And then the second is what sort of transformation or manipulation did this data have to go through? Um, and this can r- reveal things like were these data scaled to a particular benchmark? Is it normalized over the course of a year or six months? Or is it a projection into the future? Those can look very different. The answers to those kinds of questions will, of course, have very different implications on the decisions you make. But those are the two really fundamental questions I would love the new burgeoning field of data interpreters to start encouraging and evangelizing. Where does data come from and what kind of manipulations and or scaling did these data even go through? Let's start there. (laughs) Let's start there, which makes me kind of be like, ooh, a lot of the work that we're doing with um, machine learning, you know, um, transformers, large language models, these things. Ah. It seems like those two main questions are prevented from the very use of these things. Would, 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 you, would you say that maybe data interpretation is harder with AI or is data interpretation the, the fundamental nature of understanding AI? I mean, do you, can you just like wrap on that dichotomy? Because it seems like a closed system like a large language model would kind of, you wouldn't be able to even ascertain it, where it came from or what kind of transformations. Or is that the thing? Can you just wrap on it? Yeah, no, I think you're, you're really hitting the nail on the head, which is if you're unable because of the black box nature of most AI models to, or at least like, like succinctly disclose what the model was trained on. So in other words, where the data came from that you're training you know, that's not easily known or known at all. Mm -hmm. And then how exactly the mechanics of the model are transforming the data that that cannot or is very hard to answer through an AI based insight. And I don't know if you can see my air quotes through the microphone, but (laughs) they're there. there. Yep. Yep. (laughs) An AI insight because you don't know what population is being sampled in my like very traditional research vocabulary. That's the word I want to use. Mm. But I'm not aware of any method that AI can adequately sample from a, a, a representative, inclusive population and disclose that as part of the quote unquote insight it's reporting. So one of the things that we were working with with Ninja Cat, we have, we're working on a co-pilot in AI, but one of the things that I loved is that one of our engineers created this explainability function. When, when you're asking and prompting the AI, you put in your data sets, it analyzes the database and it shows you how it came to the conclusion it came to where it came, where the data came from. And that alone, I was just like, Wow. I love that because a lot of these out of the box things are just, you just take the insight and go and go nuts. But 
If you really are intense about this interpretation, understanding the orchestration of data, you know, where it's going, where it came from, you need explainability. Uh, is that, am I, am I, am I excited for the right reasons or? <laughs> yes. I mean, gosh, if that was a standard feature on every AI product moving forward, then I think a lot of the like, oh no, what path have we taken fears would be a little bit diminished. I love this idea of increasing your ability to just have some discernment and a need, a curiosity, maybe. That's the thing that might help you the most is having a sense of the data, um, having sort of that third, you know, I, I mean, it, do, do you think data, is data interpretation a mixture of statistical technical know-how and a little bit of like gut is it, does the gut play a role in interpretation yeah it it, it should and i think there's another like a third eye third eye third third eye um <laughs> right. yeah we, so which i'll i'll reveal what the third third eye is mm-hmm. in, in my mind but oh my god yes like there's yeah that's the the final trilogy <laughs> we're ready yeah. like the hard training of how to interpret something from a statistical model that's essential right and i'm not even sure most people who are using models have that and that's independent of ai you know there's just a lot of like gooey analytical tools where you can just be like i'm going to run this t test and i don't really know what it's doing but it's telling me something so that that concerns me so having a fundamental understanding of what a model is doing is critical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, you hit on something that is a lot less uh, impressive on a resume, if I was going to see it written there. But we call it the smell test. Does it smell right? Ooh. For example, if you get a, an output from a model and it has a negative sign in front of it. So there's a negative reaction you've observed. Does that smell right? Because things get published and acted upon that are real stinky. And that's like just a, a, you know, a real kind of visceral test that we apply, even though gradients are very sophisticated. Yes. Place of employment. Sure, for sure. But let us not. I I don't imagine that you have a giant nose on staff that just smells data. It's our it's the biggest expense we have is that note, <laughs> the the giant note, a big breathe right strip on it at night you're like yeah good it luck just it too <laughs> we Get have a the lot more up there through. we got four yeah, people during allergy season <laughs> <laughs> no 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 but not to belittle what you were saying what you're what you're trying to make sure and this is where i get into it it's like the technical kind of nature of this high high flying uh you know computational skills you know it's like that is all good and i want people to be working with best in class software huge models that are just crunching massive numbers and please do all that but also don't forget your nose because that might be the one thing that is standing in between you and a drastic decision. I mean, like talk about data interpretation mistakes. I mean, like, do you have like a horror story where like somebody just got the data completely wrong and it went South? I mean, it doesn't even have to be something that you've experienced, but something that you've heard about or. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, before the very expensive nose was commonplace in my world, there were some, we caught them, but like very close to catastrophic oopsies because we didn't turn on our noses. Where, I mean, it literally was, was uh, as simple as we had the wrong sign in front of a coefficient. And so we're identifying like the complete opposite direction of a relationship and making potentially very important decisions off of, off of that sign so the nose needs to be there Mm, i mean oh my gosh and at that clip at that level with that size of data the nose might be the one thing to get the needle in the haystack i mean i'm not i'm not saying noses are the only thing but do you think like you that nose could really just come in handy yeah it can and there's another the third third eye that um 
I guess there's another lot of valuable potty parts we all have, <laughs> which is having a intuition around the applicability of the insight. And by this, I mean, I worry that a lot of the very talented methodologists and data scientists who adore the methods and the models, I think many of them give zero f- about how they're used and the, the context around the application of the results that come from those models. And, you know, even when we're interviewing candidates to for like a data science role, nearly all of them don't really have a strong motivation to see how their methods and insights are applied. Mm. And then I think you run the risk of it's not too dissimilar from the black box reality where someone doing the modeling is just unaware of the world around them. It's getting on such an amazing kind of hybrid of technical prowess and then just street smarts, which I love. It's just like, hey, uh, does this does this alley feel safe to you? And you're like, it doesn't matter. You know, and you're like, but it it totally does. I mean, and, and that can be data interpretation could also hamper things. Like I'm thinking of a Nike campaign that they released maybe a year or two ago. And it was all about women running at night and how they like are owning the streets and, you know, reclaim. And, and it was seemed like a good idea, but every woman was just like, did they ask one woman about this? Because you don't do this. <laughs> and Nike's like, yeah, like championing the wrong part of the, oh God, what did we do? You know, and data interpretation is, is maybe common sense. And uh, it can be applied many different places outside of data. Would you say? Yes, totally. Well, well, then or, I, I shouldn't ask yes or no questions, Kyle, but I did. You did, but I will offer a more elaborate response because I think that data should be treated more like a, almost like, like we treat the humanities, right? Where there's like context and philosophy and implications that go into and come from data science. And it doesn't seem to be like that's the orientation that goes into any data science training. And so one filter that we try to apply when we're looking for a very talented data scientist Mm. is not only can you explain to me what this model is doing or here's a data set with these types of variable structures, what do you think the ideal model is? Mm. We ask all those questions, but one of the more telling ones is, what would you do with these results? Mm. And sadly, the common refrain is one of silence. Because, I mean, you can, I just feel all the data people being like, I'm just here. I'm just doing my thing. I'm just doing my job, you know, and that's good. But to have a greater sense of how it connects, uh, again, this is something that I'm like loving at Ninja Cat because our product people are talking to our sales people are talking to our marketing people are talking to our customer service people are talking to the tech team or talking to leadership, like everybody sharing information. So no one else gets surprised, you know, and it was just like, it's not that hard, but you have to reach across the aisle. I mean, when, if you walk into an organization, like how, how, how do you get people to break this up? Or like, you know, you've had people who were completely had data that was uninterpretable. What, 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 what's your first step? Like, how do you get people on the same page with this stuff? It's taken us quite a few years to arrive at the playbook to de-risk a potentially uninterpretable data presentation, which I've had a few too many of them early in my career. 
thankfully they're very rare these days because what we do before we actually have collected any real data mm. before any survey has been written before any variables have been drafted before any lines of code have been written we literally mock up sometimes it's on a piece of paper usually it's like on a slide and we 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 prepare a couple examples of what the output of the analysis could produce and how it could look and we prepare on those briefing pads an explanation and at the top it says Here's your strategy question. And maybe it's like, where does my audience, what does my audience want for my brand? Mm. And then we'll show a plot with some simulated data. And we'll say, does this answer that question in the way you need it to? And they'll go, well, that that dot there does in that quadrant, but I don't understand that x-axis. Or say, mm -hmm. okay, that's really valuable. We'll flip to the next stage, next page, and we've got a different kind of mock-up. And we'll go through this a few times to get to the point where then the, we can say with certainty, if the data looked like this and were presented in this way and summarized in this visualization, would you have the certainty you need to be able to answer that strategy question at the top of the page? And only when they say yes, do we then actually proceed with developing the survey, specifying the model, how the survey data are going to feed into the model. Um, but that has saved us, I don't want to know how many hundreds of times. <laughs> so we, we, we do the interpretation mm. first. Mm. Well, you get them comfortable with their questions, their needs, and then this thing that's called data. And I, I think it's like, as a marketer, I'm all oh, girl, you know, I like to cherry pick my slides. Oh, uh, you know, anything that looks like a hockey stick, put it in. <laughs> anything that doesn't look like a hockey stick, explain how it's going to be something different <laughs> later. You know, it's like data interpretation, data manipulation. Like, I think what you're saying is like, get them into a place where they can look at something that's uh, about them, but not about them. And then they can start blending this because I think maybe we all have too much skin in the game to interpret data cleanly. Do you think that's true? Do you think we're all marked? <laughs> I do. Yeah. No, I, I think there's some value in like an objective outsider to kind of like copy back to you as someone with a question, what it actually is, your question is ideally phrase in a way that you couldn't even phrase it yourself because mm -hmm. you're so you right mm -hmm. stuck in your head. So, and then to show you, you in this, you know, more eloquent question, is this going to help you sleep better at night? Right. Seeing this. Right. And then we're actually very comfortable moving forward with the data collection, the modeling, because all the questions around, wait, what does that plot mean? Wait, what is that? If this is significant, then why isn't that? Like, that's all been answered before. Here's another thing people not wanting to look stupid. Is that maybe the biggest barrier here? <laughs> Because I'm like, boy, do I not want to look dumb. Boy, do I not want to ask a dumb question. You know, like, do you, do you, what's the role of um, ego prevention in, in interpretation? Yeah, uh, there's, that probably does keep us in business a little bit because <laughs> we don't, we, we know that this can be very intimidating and career ending for some people. Oh, if they absolutely. Mass, ask a dumb question or, you know. Sure, everyone had statistics in high school, but well, did they? I mean, I actually am quite skeptical. That's true. <laughs> yes, uh, the stats are 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 incoming. Uh, we we don't know. Yeah, so that is a thing. People don't want to end their careers. They don't want to ask a silly question. What you can do as your the as consultant is come in there and create that place. You know, and maybe is there advice on people? Like, could they create that place in their own organizations? Is there some kind of like radical humility that could take place around data? No, 
No, I'm kidding. It's a harsh world. <laughs> it's so that harsh. Is, that is the, in all seriousness, though, like that is the, that is a cultural flaw that is not serving the use of data, science, in all of its forms well. Because when there's a perceptual distance between you as someone who either has something to offer to it or as a consumer of it, I mean, it's so different than like two different groups of people Mm -hmm. who are like, I don't get you, so I'm going to otherize you. I'm going to keep my distance and I'm just going to tell myself we're not compatible, even though we live in this thing called a society and we all have things to offer. So, I, yeah, I guess like I have no power to do this, but would love to see a cultural norm shift around like the exclusiveness of data science. Mm. No, I mean, it's as a, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of a creative marketer that found my way into content that then found my way into this data management thing, which I was, I was like, well, here is the heartbeat. If you really can like understand data and get your data management clean, straight, normalized, structured, orchestrated, interpreted, you know, insights bubbled up, you know, whatever you have to do, that's the heart of the whole thing. But you have to have this, I don't know what I'm doing (laughs) kind of approach. And then you have these great conversations where everyone's like, well, here's this, here's that. And maybe we can share, maybe we can create the truth together. But here, I I need to get a story out of you about you actually applying this stuff because you have a great approach to it. I love that there's philosophical concepts in here. The fact that data science needs to behave more like the humanities, like that is just, But I want you to describe a project where you integrated market research with data science to solve a complex problem. Like, how'd you approach it? What were the outcomes? Do you, do you have an example? I've got examples. Yeah. Just like a lot more than those hot dogs with skeletons that you were referring to earlier. That was before recording. So now people need to know before we were recording, I was <laughs> telling Kyle about the first hot dogs having skeletons. Focus, Kyle. <laughs> answer my question the mic is on um (laughs) no i've got a lot of examples of where we can weave marketing with data science and do so in a i'll call it in the in the spirit of the humanities love it so uh i i I won't name the specific client this was for but i don't think that's even relevant um but we had a, a a a a client of ours who was a household food and beverage brand that mm-hmm. all have heard of. And they have global ambitions. They want young people in particular all over the world to become fans of this brand, and buy it and use it both at home and when they go out. And they haven't really been able to do that. Their sales numbers for younger generations were just flat at best. Mm -hmm. And they had tried a lot of different ways to position the product, market it, price it, and like nothing was really moving the metrics. So they said, their question was, I don't think we understand the world in which these younger generations are operating. We don't know what aspirations they have. We don't know what fears they have. We don't even really know how, like the occasions around in which they use our product. So this is like a very standard market research question, Mm -hmm. but we, we didn't want to answer it in a very standard market research way, because as you said, you, that's a, a a bit of a risk because you can just kind of pick your own adventure when you've just got spreadsheet after spreadsheet and like some cells are red and some are green and you can just tell a story based on that, but it may just be because you didn't scroll all the way to the bottom left, but there's like a lot more red cells. <laughs> yeah, that's right. dangerous. That's not data science, to be perfectly clear. That's just Correct. picking around for colors, basically. Right. Um, so we applied a model-based approach to be able to extract from the same type of survey data, but what are the drivers of the attributes of this particular brand that young people around the world actually come into play when they become aware of this brand, when they become aware and start moving into considering buying, and what are the attributes of this brand that are at play when they move from 
considering to actually purchasing. And so we, uh, we developed a statistical model that for every single country in which we did this research, we could say like, that what matters about your brand is this attribute. And for this market, what they really see as like the, the, the value in your whole brand is a different one. And the beauty of this was we're not having to cherry pick anything. Like the model is surfacing the drivers of sales and they're different by market. And they were uh, admittedly quite different from the brand's existing self-perception. Right. And we had to kind of have a, like we had that, that really was just one chart for each country. That's all it took. There was not much to really interpret. Like it was plain and clear. And we knew that was going to be plain and clear because we had tested this with them in advance. So they described earlier. Right. And it gives them sort of very, very clear guidance or if they want to appeal to younger generations in countries A, B, C, and D, they need to project very different equities or attributes about their brand mm. to the buyers in those countries. Mm. It's like a blend of social perception and empathy for directed commercial purposes. And I just don't think that's wrong. Like you think, well, you're manipulating one person. You're saying, you know, I'm, I don't know who it is, but you're saying this soft drink is the freedom fighter. And the soft drink is the conservative one. And it's the same thing in different markets. Like, do you think that there would be some kind of, uh, there's, there's safety. There's, egoic safety in me knowing what my brand stands for, but knowing that different people interpret differently. Now I have a schizophrenic brand personality. Like what's your thought to this person? Who's like, I need to be consistent. Like that's who we are. Uh, do they not yeah. want to make money? It sounds like they just don't want to make money, but <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a, it's a real world problem, right? right. Like in a diverse world with, you know, 192 countries and, um, you know, diverse populations within each of them. Like, it's really hard to have a consistent brand that's going to appeal to all of them. Mm. So the other beauty of using a model-based approach is you can model what the sales metrics or projected sales metrics of your brand would be in all these different countries if you were able to maybe just slightly increment how you're perceived a little bit. So you don't have to necessarily be 100% this and 100% that. But with a model-based approach, you can simulate the effect on your sales if you were just slightly perceived to be slightly different, maybe on like one attribute that matters. Um, do, do you know, um, you know Veemer Snijders is this dude. Um, I, I don't know. He's, he's somewhere in the northern parts, but Veemer Snijders, um, he wrote a book called eat your greens, but one of his things is ultra light category buyers. He was like, this is where the growth comes from. The growth doesn't come from making like loyalists, like insane brand ambassadors. The true growth comes from having one person try it once in a year. Like, and I, that like blew my head off. I was like, wait, what? Hold on. Wait, what? But with those models, you can say, look, you're not trying to create brand fanatics. You're trying to increase your market share by just a little bit. This is how you can do it. Here's a model that shows you what you could do. If you do it right, it's up to you <laughs> to do what you want. But I think one of the other sh cultural shifts is that market penetration comes from mad loyalists. Um, do, do, do you see that born in your research? Like, does it come from an insane person who buys 200 million Cokes or does getting 200 million people to try one thing, a Coke a year? Like, no, it's, it's, it's certainly the, you know, the, the, what was it? The ultra light buyer, because then that's going to have a, a ripple effect because then one other person's going to see them doing it. And that one other person's going to post, you know, Oh, here's my delicious, like new popsicle or carbonated probiotic. <laughs> Whatever water, it is, you're real right. thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I think that's going to have more of a of a ripple effect in society than like a high concentration of 
purchases among one very consumptive individual. I have one question. If you had to give somebody one piece of advice on data interpretation, what would it be? I'm going to refer back to that fundamental question that any consumer of data needs to ask. This is a bit of a lost art in science, but is what is this population? What is the data? Which population is the data trying to speak to? Like, I just see so much abuse of that, both in commercial and political um, applications. And I'm like, you need to know, like the sam- sampling methodology and where your data are speaking to, to who your data is speaking to, like that has to be the one fundamental lesson that any interpreter of data needs to really master. I love it. So great. Get a tattoo of it. It might be too long, but try. Um, Kyle, thank you so much for your time. Um, it, you've, you've given it to us in, in uh, an amazing, replete, treasure chest filled episode. Um, if people want to get with you or connect or you know, learn more about you, how can they do that online? You um, can follow me on LinkedIn. We share a ton of survey design best tips, market research and data science, best um, practices. So Kyle Block, B-L-O-C-K. I'm very active on LinkedIn. My email address is kyle at gradientmetrics.com. Always happy to have a conversation about any interpretation question, big or small. Please don't be shy. Cheese or chocolate? Are you ready? I'm a little nervous, but let's proceed. Cheese or chocolate? Cheese, please. Okay. Bacon or sausage? Bacon, very crispy. Required. Oh, okay. Whoa, whoa. Okay. Broccoli or cauliflower? Broccoli. I do want to live to at least 40. <laughs> cauliflower will kill you apparently you heard it from kyle it already looks dead (laughs) it's some you be nice to cauliflower okay um cake or death oh by that point in the party it's probably time to just take the death (laughs) i'm hanging out with kyle um this, I don't know if this is contentious. Hard or soft pillow? <laughs> um, I don't think there should be really a lot of hard things in a bed. So let's go with soft. Soft and maybe get two or three of them and then you can get to a medium pillow. Uh, I don't know how math works, but that checks out. Um, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Finally, and most seriously, Gandalf or Alf? Gandalf. Gandalf. Yeah. There's no choice. Alf eats cats. <laughs> we can't deal with that. That uh, yeah, it, no. What gets measured is a ninja cat podcast. Please rate and review the show wherever you find your podcasts. Share this episode on social. And visit us on the web at ninjacat.io.